This is the Topping D90 Digital to Analog Converter, and it's one of the best measuring digital to analog converters you can buy, yet it's only $700. Now the question is, do excellent measurements translate into excellent sound? That's what I aim to find out. Shenzhen Audio kindly sent me this DAC for review after a number of people suggested it was a valid competitor to the Bifrost 2. And since I just reviewed that, I thought, well, let's try one which is aimed purely at excellent measurements. Now, it has a number of features the Bifrost 2 doesn't, but if we look on the back, it looks like a regular digital to analog converter with a number of digital inputs and analog outputs. Of those digital inputs, there are quite a variety. Your standard kind of digital input, other than just the USB input here, is called SPDIF, which is this RCA connector here. Now, the optical version of that, of course, is your optical Toslink input, and your balanced version of that, well, more or less, is your AES input. So it's got all three kind of much the same kind of thing. And if you have a long digital cable run, maybe AES is better, but some people like to use it, and otherwise I wouldn't worry about it too much. Now you also have, interestingly, a Bluetooth input. Now this has become popular on uh, Chinese brand uh, DACs these days. The other interesting input, which you don't see quite so much, which is becoming more popular, is I2S. This HDMI connector is actually not HDMI, so you can't plug, say, a video player into it. It just uses the same plug, much as the uh, RCA plug for SPDIF uses the same plug as a regular RCA analog connector. It actually has a different function. Now I2S probably deserves a little bit of uh, explanation. Now if you think probably the best way to describe it is to think of video. Video you can either have a composite uh, connector which does actually look much like SPDIF although the signal is obviously different and it contains all the information for the video signal just like SPDIF contains all the information for a digital signal. Now the problem with that is you Combining everything together, supposedly you lose a little bit of quality, at least in video you do. So the highest quality version is component, where each individual component has its own plug. So in much the same way, digital has a number of connections which are combined in SPDIF, but once you get inside a DAC, they are split into their individual components, which use a kind of connection called I2S. Now it was originally a connector between the components inside a DAC and not supposed to be external, but in separating out the different uh, digital components, and especially the clock signal versus the data signal, it may or may not be possible to get a higher quality transmission. So that's what this is. Using a HDMI connector, it splits out the clock signal and the actual data signals into separate wires. So, so it's become popular these days with uh, USB to uh, SPDIF or USB to I2S converters to improve the quality of the input of the digital signal versus using just SPDIF or an inbuilt USB. But other than that, it's a balanced deck with a balanced output, which of course is very popular, and you have single-ended outputs as well. Onto the front, you have, well, a screen with all the information and a power button and your and a selector here. Most of the actual control of the DAC is done through this remote control. It's the same remote control as if you buy a topping amp. And it has, well, your power selection mute button, which is very handy in case you've accidentally turned the volume up too high. And you have, although a couple of the buttons don't actually do anything, you can change the digital filters and you can switch the, interestingly, you can switch the line out between having either just the XLR outputs just the RCA outputs or both together, which is very handy if you're connecting up two different things and you want to switch between the outputs and have the sound going through one component but not another. You can also cycle between the outputs and dim the display from here. And well, basically you probably spend most of the time controlling the DAC through this remote control. But one of the other handy features about this is that it is a preamp. You can actually can change the volume level of the output and use it as a preamp. Compare of course to the uh, Bifrost 2, where its main features are that it can be upgraded easily just by unscrewing the uh, back panel at the and pulling the components straight out. So, whereas something like the Bifrost 2, its feature set is primarily to be upgradable, the feature set of this is primarily to be able to do a lot of stuff. One of the really cool features actually that did show up, which I didn't, haven't seen on any other DAC as well, I2S inputs are kind of not very standardized. They're slightly different between manufacturers. Now, one of the primary differences is which is the left channel, which is the right channel, and which is positive and which is negative. Now, interestingly, the output of my D300 reference does have a different 
uh, configuration to the, the stock input of the topping. So actually when I found out that I could go in and start it up and adjust that via the remote control and the selectors on the front, I was very pleased because then I could switch it to something that was compatible with the D300 reference so that I could test the I2S input and see if it made any improvement over the, in the, with the sound of the DAC, something which if you watch on I will talk about. So that's kind of uh, an overview of what's on the outside. Actually, let's take a look inside. As far as digital to analog converters go, the topping D90 is fairly conventional. You have, starting, well, let's start with the digital input. Here you have your SPDIF and Bluetooth and all that. Now the USB down here goes into this XMOS chip, which is XMOS, fairly common. It's probably about the most popular these days for digital uh, conversion from USB. And then you have your SPDIF inputs go to, into this AKM4118, which is a 24192 digital converter for SPDIF and the like. And then now I can't be entirely sure of the path. It could be a multi-layer circuit board. We have an Altera Max 2 here. This is an FPGA and it's programmable. I can be, have any function that's programmed into it essentially. And I think the, the uh, programming interface of these, these points here very likely someone will press down something on the board as it's uh, as the programming is done via another computer. Bluetooth input, of course, goes into this Bluetooth receiver. And you have an ARM chip here. Now, I don't know entirely what is uh, controlling the functionality, such as the volume control and all that, and what is doing other things. But interesting thing, you have these AccuSilicon clocks, and they are very, very high-precision clocks. Now, all digital requires clocks, and so it affects the timing of the circuit. And... Uh, these are extremely high precision clocks. You know, the lower quality of the clocks, the lower quality of the sound. So the use of these is, is pretty good. You have the ribbon cable, of course, goes to the front panel. The power supply, here you have your transformer and input. And the power supply is pretty much all this along here that supplies power to the, uh, the FPGAs and through the digital conversion circuit. So you have different maybe little groups of power supplies here, maybe one for each channel, possibly something like that, and maybe uh, for the digital circuits. Power supplies are very important in uh, especially digital to analog converters. The, uh, any kind of noise or uh, ripple in there, that anything, anything uneven is going to affect the quality of the, uh, well, the output, I suppose. And so you have a lot of capacitors here. And you have some big capacitors here that I'm not entirely sure what they are for specifically. They do look impressive. Now there's the 4499 EQ. That's your actual digital, digital to analog converter. So the digital signal will be converted in here and then be output through here to the either the XLR or RCA. And of course, there'd be some way connected to this control circuit and ability to switch between, switch these on or off. I did spot uh, these uh, uh, 49710 op amps or 49720 possibly, uh, because it's very hard to see close up. These are fairly well-known um, op, op amps for uh, you know, analog output. And you know, they're good op amps in a good circuit. Of course, it's very circuit dependent with the quality of the sound that comes out. And they're fairly common, much like the XMOS is a common USB receiver. These are very common, good op amps. And the basic design has been around for a long time. And these are, of course, an entire amplification circuit on a chip. Of course, the output of a digital to analog converter has to be put through some kind of circuit to filter out very high frequency noise and the quality of that circuit and the quality of the uh, output does affect the uh, overall sound quality as much as the uh, quality of the clocks and the rest of the setup does. So that's a kind of rough overview of the uh, D90 insides and it certainly does look pretty and is fairly straightforward in functionality as far as I can see. So that leads on, but how well does this translate to sound? I ran the topping with the other variety of gear I see here and of course headphones and other equipment to kind of give it an evaluation and also compared it to the Shit Audio Bifrost 2 as well as, you know, the Yggdrasil and Hugo 2. And it was quite interesting because, again, I wanted to know how a pure, you know, adapted design purely to measure excellently would perform against you know, other equipment. So in that I ran them from the USB from my Mac Mini, which is sitting under here using generic cables. And that gives, you know, that is kind of in terms of digital transports kind of middle of the road it's not as good as a high quality say usb transport or high quality source such as this d3000 reference but also it's probably better than some pcs which maybe have very noisy usb outputs you know outputs that dump a lot of noise and those that noise can get into the dac and uh, affect the quality of the overall output I also tried them with the uh, D300 reference as well, just for comparison, to see how good the quality of the USB 
in these components is. Now I'm gonna start by saying, if this is you're watching this video to, because you're considering buying the Topping D90 and this will be your first $700 DAC or the most expensive DAC you've ever bought and you want to know, you know, is it going to be any good? I think unless you listen to really lousy music and it's really, you know, only just crappy 128 MP, MP3 or whatever, you will notice a distinct jump up in sound quality. The sound quality overall is kind of very smooth, clean, clear. And if you're wondering, you know, do, do measurements translate to... Uh, good kind of sound quality. No, not really. That's kind of a more of a nuanced thing. But in terms of like sonic performance alone, the topping was pretty excellent. Smooth sounding, non-fatiguing, and matched with something like this uh, THX AAA 789 was a really nice pairing that was very easy to listen to. You could drive a variety of even very expensive headphones. And I can say, yes, you can put, you can stop right here Yes, it's going to be a good value DAC, and, and especially if you're going to use something like the, the, the preamp and other features in it. Now, if you want the more nuanced answer, watch on. And this is where comparing with a Bifrost made it very interesting. Now, I've always said comparisons are evil. I mean, if I bought this DAC and then this amp, for example, and, you know, as a system, and I'd not earned anything that expensive before, I'd be extremely happy. I think I'd probably be overjoyed. And I've seen one reviewer for whom it was his first, you know, high-end DAC, and he was very happy with it. Now, that being said, no, it doesn't beat the very, very, very expensive gear in terms of overall performance sonically, and that's where things get a little bit more interesting. Let's just talk about the Bifrost because it's the one I'm gonna compare it to. Now, to talk about the Bifrost, I've already done a review of the Bifrost. If you want to watch that review, I'm gonna chuck a little card up in the corner here, which you can click on and, and watch that review. The shit audio, like every manufacturer, has what's called a house sound. And that is like the, the engineer's preferred kind of result of how the sound comes out. Now, if you think, but if it measures correctly, blah, blah, no, 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 this is more subtle than that. I have to talk about measurements here a little bit. When you see measurements, they are like an instant snapshot of performance. They don't show how something performs when music is playing through. It's kind of like if you did a dyno, put a car on a dyno, and then took the end curve and then put that online, it doesn't, it only shows that simple snapshot of, you know, what went on it. It doesn't show how it performs going, say, driving out on the street around corners or on a racetrack. And that's the kind of difference you have here. But back to house sound, the shit audio house sound to me is kind of in this dead on middle of the road between sounding kind of warm, uh, music, musical, yes, I know musicality is undefined, but just bear with me from warm kind of musical sound like Audio GD, like Kitsune and Hollow Spring, that kind of deck. On the other hand, you have kind of dry, cold, uh, clear sound, you know, measurement focus like Benchmark, maybe like Fio and some other uh, manufacturers out there where they're just designed to measure excellently. Now, Shit Audio, I still consider the Bifrost maybe to be a touch what I would call dry soundings, but it has a little bit of what I call musicality probably as a result of using the, the ladder DACs and the setup with the digital filters that Mike Moffat has put in here. It's a little bit kind of narrower and less clear sounding than the Yggdrasil, which is kind of a little bit more open sounding. There are some other subtle differences which I could get into, but I will once I get around to uh, talking about the Yggdrasil Analog 2 and its Unison USB upgrade. Speaking of which, you know, in terms of features, the uh, focus of the Bifrost 2 is more on the fact that, you know, it, it's aimed for just PCM listening. There's no DSD. It has one digital filter. It's aimed to do the best possible with the largest variety of music out there. In other words, standard CD quality. It does really well on, in high res too. I mean, if you put high res through it up to 192K, it essentially ran, runs in non-oversampling mode as you don't really need oversampling for, you know, an 18-bit DAC in that kind of case. So you get a very kind of pure... Uh, conversion going there. Although the fact high res is another discussion which I'll talk about in other videos. Now of course the topping is completely different in that regard. It's used, you know, it's aimed to have very excellent measurements. It's very smooth sounding and it has, just like AKM, describe it, uh, them as having a velvet sound. This very much matched that kind of description. To me I consider it like glass. I can look out here at the nature through the glass windows, but it's not quite the same as going out onto the balcony and being in the nature. And that's the kind of feeling I get with a lot of modern decks. With the AKM decks, that smoothness is very pleasant and very easy going. But compared to the Bifrost, I felt the Bifrost with the high quality recordings I often use, say from David Chesky and others, and I'll 
if I remember, I'll put up a, a, a list in the description of some of the music I've been using lately. Same things like, you know, a guitar pluck or, you know, violin notes, or maybe, you know, you hear some kind of note and it's echo off the, uh, the walls of the venue, especially like the David Chesky stuff that's shot in a church or other kinds of music. Those very little subtle nuances seem to be a little bit truncated or a little bit lost with the topping. I seem to lose them a little bit, and that smoothness, I wonder, maybe makes the sound a little bit flat in, you know, compared to, say, the other decks. Now, if you're listening to it on its own, you don't notice these things. If you compare, and I've always said comparisons are evil, compare, then I felt that the Bifrost brought out the subtle nuances very slightly better than the topping did. It was a funny thing, a little funny parallel. I've been listening with uh, Cayenne's N6 Mark II lately. It has a variety of amp and DAC modules you can plug in. One of them, the A01 module, uses an AKM4497. Another one, the T01, uses the uh, Burr Brown 1792. Now, the Burr Brown is a semi-multi-bit DAC. Another complication, but don't worry about the fine details. But the interesting thing was the 4497 in here, much like kind of the, the uh, Fio's M11 Pro, which also uses a 4497, has that same kind of smooth, kind of very pleasant sound. But when I put in the Burr Brown module in here, I felt that those, again, those subtle nuances came out a little bit better from the Burr Brown module. Whereas the, the AKM module seemed to sound a little bit flat. The topping also sounded a little bit flat in its presentation. The Burr Brown module, like the Bifrost 2, sounded a little bit more kind of musical. And, you know, more the subtleties of the notes came out better. The kind of feeling of the venue came out better. More kind of depth to the sound. Now, that was an interesting thing because I thought maybe it could have something to do with the input. Now, we already have the Bifrost 2 has its own custom designed USB designed to perform much better than the commercial offerings. This uses a standard commercial XMOS chipset. So I plugged them both in via, in respectively, I squared S, and I also tried AES with the same results, and SPDIF into the D300 reference. You know, that's a $3,000 streamer. I wouldn't necessarily recommend you buying $3,000 streamer to use with a $700 DAC, but I wanted to kind of get the an idea how much, if anything, the USB on either of them was holding them back. Now, uh, Mike Moffat reckons his Unison USB is better than an AES input, which is, as I said, a, a balanced version of SPDIF, essentially. And so the topping, well, I noticed that some of that flatness to the sound did go away, and it did sound a little bit more kind of musical while keeping that very clean, clear, and even sound when using the uh, D300 reference as a source. So it became more pleasant overall to listen with. While I would have considered it a little bit flat, unless of course it was my first $700 purchase, we maybe there was a little bit more of an improve, a little bit of an improvement with the Bifrost 2. It's kind of, I'm experimenting a little bit with the Yggdrasil at the moment about how good the Unison USB is, and I'll report in another video. But there was a distinct jump up from the topping when it, you had a better quality input. Now again, I wouldn't recommend spending $3,000 on a streamer. There are quite a variety of USB to SPDIF or USB to I2S converters like Singza has been very popular lately. Actually, uh, Kitsune Audio, whose uh, DAC I also reviewed, the when I reviewed the Hollow Spring, also sent over a... Uh, SPDF and I2S converter, which you can buy, although you're kind of looking at a price almost as much as the DAC itself. But I did notice an improvement, and it'd be interesting to see how little one might be able to spend. It might be just a couple of hundred dollars, and you might be able to improve the sound quality of this, either from a USB isolator or some kind of converter. But it's interesting all the same. So that puts the USB as good, but not quite as excellent maybe as the Unison 2 in the Bifrost. But what it made for a, a DAC overall was, you know, it's still a pretty good DAC. And compared to the Yggdrasil, you're only a little bit behind in detail. Now, you may have already heard, read, read that many people have said that the Bifrost 2 is a mini Yggdrasil. It is very close, and only kind of in speakers do you notice maybe it's slightly narrower sounding than an Yggdrasil. It seems to be maybe a tiny fraction more rolled off sounding than an Yggdrasil, whereas Yggdrasil sounds kind of a little bit more open, maybe a little bit deeper as well. In terms of the differences between these, level match, these differences are very small. And in, I'm really happy that I got a chance to compare you know, a DAC which is focused on measurements versus a DAC that is focused, well, not just on measuring, it still measures pretty well, but one on, on sounding really excellent. And I can, if the topping appeals to you, either because of the measurements, because of the features, I can definitely recommend it. It's kind of which 
which goals appeal to you in terms of design? You know, made in America, if that appeals, you're going to buy an, an American made deck. If the upgradability appears, appeals to you, if the, uh, the musicality of the ladder deck appeals to you, uh, the, the R2R deck appeals to you, the Bifrost. If the features and the measurements and that kind of thing appeal to you, then definitely the topping. So that's kind of how I felt about the topping D90. And thanks very much to Shenzhen Audio for sending one over. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, and also click on the subscribe button to be notified when I have a video out in the future. Also, any comments, questions, thoughts, even constructive criticism is most welcome. Do you own a Topping D90? Did you buy one or try one? Do let us know in the comments below so people not only can watch the video and get their, my impressions, but also get other people's impressions to help them decide whether this is a good or not product to buy. Also, would you like my buying advice anytime? Would you like to see these videos in advance without ads? Do consider becoming a supporter. These videos are primarily supported by people such as yourself. And in exchange, you can get direct access to me. You can, get, you can join our little community of supporters and that could end up saving you considerably more than the amount you help support me with. So check out the links below for more information about that. And as always, thanks once again for watching and I'll see you online.